is injustice in the world. There is injustice in this society. There is injustice in every community. Throughout the world, throughout our society, throughout every community, morally sensitive people are perplexed about the pervasive and the continually, constantly building power of oppression and deceit, hate and corruption. I imagine immigrant parents and their children are crying out for justice and liberation. They've been crying out for weeks, months. How long does it take for God to hear them? They've been crying out. Hateful politicians hateful policies. The babies are crying. Their mamas and daddies are crying. The relatives who sent them north hoping they'd get a better life are crying. Meanwhile, in the United States, politicians who boast that we are a society of immigrants with straight faces support cruel and hateful treatment of immigrant and asylum seeking men, women, and children every day. They're approving contracts to have God's children placed in pens. And folks who run the companies that have these contracts are falling all over themselves to try to get the contracts. There's injustice in the world. There's injustice in our society. There's injustice in our community. People who are outraged about Colin Kaepernick taking a knee during the playing of the national anthem during professional football games showed no outrage when Bradley Blackshire got gunned down by a police officer in Little Rock earlier this year. Didn't show any outrage, outrage when Atashiana Jefferson was gunned down by a police officer in her own house while playing with her nephew. No outrage. They're mad at Colin Kaepernick for taking a knee. But they're not showing any outrage about this woman getting shot down in her own house. When Botham Jean John got gunned down in his own apartment, they're mad. They're not mad. Even though the person who killed him was convicted of murder, she only got 10 years, only got 10 years, the lightest sentence, and they're mad at Colin Kaepernick? There is injustice in the world. There is injustice in our society. And people who have moral sensitivity, people who have feelings about right and wrong, can't help but feel it. Can't help but feel it. And these kind of situations and others put morally sensitive people in the same spirit, the same mind that the prophet Habakkuk was in as we read these words from Habakkuk's powerful book. The Hebrew Testament book, the Old Testament book, the Hebrew Testament book named Habakkuk sheds light on the moral condition of the Judahite people, the people in Judah, uh, during the 12-year period between the death of King Josiah in 609 BCE, before the Christ era, and the first deportation of exiles to Babylon in 597. 12 years, 12 years. And we get a sense for how that prophet summed up the condition of that society, the unjust, the sad, the powerfully grievous, sad condition when we read the first reading 
O Lord, how long shall I cry for help? And you will not listen. Or cry to you violence. And you will not say. You get the idea that this is somebody who has been looking at situations and praying about it and hearing other folks say, when's the Lord going to do something? And then we read that next line. Why do you make me see wrongdoing and look at trouble? Why do you keep showing me this stuff? Why does it keep coming up? I, I can't get away from it. I can't turn it off. I can't turn off the news. Every channel has more drama. I can't get away from this, God. Why do you keep me? I can't go on vacation from it because it's everywhere I go. Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. In other words, there's trouble everywhere. Trouble here, trouble there, trouble ahead of me, trouble behind me, trouble above me, trouble below me. I cannot get away. And it's not just, it's just trouble. It's, it's trouble that has been legalized. We read this word, so the law becomes slack and justice never prevails. The wicked surround the righteous, therefore judgment comes forth perverted. God, I'm in the right and I go to the courthouse and the judge has been brought off. I can't get my case heard because the, the system is geared toward the folks who are oppressing me as opposed to the people who are being oppressed. Lord, I can't get away from this. Sound familiar? I've been going down to this board and that board. I've been going to this place and that place. And everywhere I turn, I get the same old, same old. Wait, 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 and then nothing. Wait, 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 and then nothing. Or wait, 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 and then no. Perverted judgments, twisted judgments, upside down judgments. The folks who are supposed to be down are up. The low down folks are on, the, on top. The low down folks are on top. And the folks who are upright are on the bottom. That's what you mean, perverted judgment. And so, God, I'm dealing with this. I'm seeing this. I can't get away from it. Because it's too obvious. And the weak and the oppressed are at the mercy of the strong. They hope for deliverance. They pray that God will see their plight. God will hear their cries. God will know their anxieties. God will identify with their sense of outrage and indignation and that God will do something to deliver them. And so we read this word from the prophet. Oh, Lord, how long? How long? And then nothing changes. The crooked Courts and judges keep on issuing unjust decisions that benefit the oppressors and compound the burdens of the people who oppress. The prices keep going high and the quality keeps going down. Making the people who buy potato chips mad. You're, getting, you're paying more for a bag of potato chips and getting less stuff in it. <laughs> 
same size bag, paying more money, open the bag, you see in a bunch of air and a few chips. And you don't have anybody to complain to. You can't fuss at the machine. You can't do anything. You, the price is going up. And what you're getting is going down. And nothing changes. The folks who are putting folks out of work are getting bonuses. And the folks who are working are getting laid off. And nothing changes. The people who are trying to take care of folks are not getting raises. And the folks who are doing a sorry job of running the places to take care of people are making prices higher. And the folks who are trusting the folks who run the care places to care for their loved ones are frustrated because their loved ones are getting paid, are getting cared for, and nothing changes. You complain to the government, and the government doesn't help. You complain to the customer service, and the customer service does not serve. And you ask, God, how long? How long? That was a backup situation. If you ever been in that situation, you know how Habakkuk felt. You know how Habakkuk felt. This was a 12-year issue. You remember 12 years a slave? Okay, this is a 12-year issue. The cricket stuff kept going on for 12 years. Nothing changes. The predatory lenders move out of one neighborhood and come back another way. Wealthy people get paid by society to do crooked stuff using tax dollars from unwealthy working people. How long, oh Lord? Lord, don't you see what's happening down here? Don't you know what they're doing? If you've experienced these thoughts, you're in good company. You're in Habakkuk's situation. Now, it's tempting to give up on God. We've been hurt so long. And nothing seems to get better. It's tempting. Oh, don't act like you don't know what I'm talking about. It's tempting to quit praying. It's tempting to say, you know what? I'm just throwing up my hands. It's tempting to take matters into our own hands. Not in the sense that we are working with God, our hands are in God's hands doing God's work while we're waiting for God to get something done, but for us to throw up our hands and say, listen, if God not going to do something, I'm going to do something. There was an old, well, not very old, there was, a, there was a cartoon that I recall from several years ago. Two vultures, two vultures sitting on a tree. And one vulture looks at the other one and says, patience, my, I'm going to kill something. <laughs> patience, my, I'm going to kill something. Uh, sometimes we have the temptation. And remember now, that was what Abraham and Sarah did. Abraham and Sarah had been waiting for so long for that promised child, and it hadn't come. And so they said, we're going to take something in our own hands. It is tempting to say, listen, God, if you are not going to show up, I may as well do something. If you're not going to work with me, if I can't count on you for help, I'm going to help myself. And people give up on God for those reasons. They get tired of waiting. They get tired of being frustrated. They get tired of every new day with the same old drama and the same old pain and the same old mess and the same old lies and the same old hurt. And after they have waited and cried and prayed and begged deliverance and waited only to see oppressors seem to gain, it's tempting to say, 
Okay, God, forget it. And then other people give up on God by changing sides. You know the old adage, if you can't beat them, join them. They say, well, Lord, if you're not going to give me deliverance, since the only folks getting blessed are the crooks, I may as well join the crooks. Lord, I've been trying to do this on the up and up, and every time I try to do it on the up and up, I get, well, I may as well go and do it down on the, on, on the other side. A lot of our brothers and sisters got into the drug business not because they wanted to be in the drug business, but because the harder they worked at the legitimate business, the more behind they got. They couldn't get a raise on that job that wasn't paying much in the first place. The bills kept going up. They weren't making any money. And guess what? Somebody said, listen, you can make a little money if you can sell a little weed. And so he tried to sell a little weed. And guess what? They found out you're not making any money. Because there are folks that are paid to find you on the weed and pick up your weed, take your weed from you, charge you, and you still got the same bills. You still got the same job, and your job might let you go because you got that conviction. You, you, you know, but, but they have, you see, sometimes they've taken matters in their own hands because they just have this painful reality of waiting while they're hurting, and they've been hurting and waiting so long that they decide, I am not going to keep hurting in this economic problem situation. I'm going to try to do something. No, it's not right. But that's what people do, don't they? Sometimes we need to understand that the situation that Habakkuk mentioned is part of the reason why some folks are in the situation they're in. Then other folks give up on God by saying, hey, well, I'm going to join the crooks. Franz Frenon was a black man who wrote a book titled The Wretched of the Earth. And he wrote that oppressors are always able to find some marginalized people who are willing to become accomplices with them in oppression. There are always some folks who are willing to join in with the folks who are hurting you. But Habakkuk offers another alternative in the second reading we have, in the second chapter. And that alternative is watch and wait for God. Oh, Reverend, now don't go there. Don't go there because you started out by saying you people got tired of waiting. They got tired of watching. They've been watching and waiting and watching and waiting and nothing changes. Now you're going to say watch and wait for God. But there it is in that second, second reading. I will stand at my watch post and station myself on the rampart. I will keep watch to see what he will say to me. And what he will answer concerning my complaint. And then in verse 3 we read, For there is a vision for the appointed time. It speaks of the end and does not lie. Verse 4, verse 3, If it seems to tarry, wait for it. Watch and wait. Watch and wait. Wait for it. It will surely come. Watch and wait. It will not delay. Wait a minute. Why you say it don't delay? I've been, I've been asking how long, and you say it won't delay. What in the world are you talking about, preacher? I'm saying that our our deliverance from God is not defined based on our discomfort meter. Did you hear me? 
our deliverance from God is not based on our discomfort meter. You didn't catch it. You didn't catch it. How long am I going to be uncomfortable? How long am I going to have to put up with this? Lord, I've been putting up with this long enough. I am up to my here with this. It's time, Lord, because I am through. My discomfort meter is over the top. It's time for you to deliver. According to my discomfort meter, the schedule ought to be now for my deliverance. You catch me? I've been waiting for weeks, months, years, decades, generations, centuries. How long was Israel in Egypt? 400 years before Moses showed up. Wait for it. Mm. Do you think that they weren't suffering? No. Remember what Moses heard the, from, the, from that burning bush? I have seen the oppression of my children. I have heard their cries. I have seen the brutality of their taskmasters. God has seen it. God has witnessed it for all those 400 years. The discomfort meter was up. God was not blind. The people were not faithless. The people were not silent. But the deliverance didn't come. After the first 10 years, or the first 20 years, or the first 30 years, or the first 400 years, the first 100, 200, 300 years, people lived and died in slavery, praying, praying to be delivered. They were born in slavery and they saw their parents who had lived in slavery die in slavery. And then they saw their children sold off from them in slavery. And then they grew old and they died in slavery. And their children The discomfort meter was up. And yet it seemed that there was no deliverance. But there is that word. There is still a vision for the appointed time. My brothers and my sisters, this is hard for you and me to accept, but God's schedule is deeper and wider than our clocks. Verse 3 says, it speaks of the end. God sees the end. You and I are seeing where we are. If you're stuck in a bad situation, where you don't see any way out, you don't see the end out. I mean, that's what they mean by I don't see my way out. I don't see the end. I don't know where out is. I know I want out. I hope that they're out is somewhere. I won't out show up now, but I don't know where out is. I've been trying to find out. I've been trying to knock on doors. That's, that's not the way out. I've been trying to open windows. That's not the way out. I've been trying to knock down. That's not the way out. I, there ought to be a way out, but I cannot find out where out is. And then that verse 3 is, there is a vision for the appointed time. It speaks of the end. God knows where out is.
And that's the prophet's comfort. The old folks had a way of putting it. The Lord knows. That's all they would say. The Lord knows. When is somebody going to get, when is so-and-so going to get right? The Lord knows. When are these folks going to quit messing around? The Lord knows. And we thought that they were just being pat, but they were truly affirming a faith that said that God's knowledge of the end does not require them to see it. It only requires them to know that God does. And the prophet is told, write this vision, write this vision that God knows, that God has a knowledge of deliverance, that God has the plan for deliverance, and to write that on tablets and make it a billboard size. That's what that word means in chapter two, verse two, chapter, verse two of chapter two. Then the Lord answered me and said, write the vision, make it plain on tablets so that a runner can read it. In other words, when you're running, you're slow, you don't have to even slow down to be able to catch it. It's so big, you don't have to slow down. God's got this. Several weeks ago, Ben gave several of us these bracelets. And at first, I wasn't too cool because I don't like to wear a whole bunch of stuff. But it, 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 it's, it, it's, it got to me. It got to me. And it got to me because it has this word, God's got this. God's got this. Now, I, I'm, I, that doesn't mean I don't have anything to do with it. It doesn't mean I don't have any, any agency in it. It doesn't mean I have to just sit back and do nothing. But it means that as I am waiting and watching and praying and fussing with God about how come God's taking so long, I need to remember God's got this. When I'm mad about how come it's not happening faster, I need to remember that God's got this. God's got my anger, and God's got my frustration, and God's got the mess that's been dealt with me, and God's got everything I'm going through. God's got this. And then we have that word, word verse 4 of the second chapter, look at the proud, their spirit is not right in them. And I think, oh, Lord, have mercy, that's the truth. <laughs> you, know, you, you know, let me give you the homeboy paraphrase. You heard folks say, no, that child ain't right. <laughs> you heard folks say, no, he, she's not right. You can't do a thing with them. You can't, you can't talk right into them. You can't work right into them. You can't reason right into them. You can't make them do right with changing laws. You cannot. If there's only one right way to do it, they won't find it. You've heard of folks, some folks who could mess up a one-car parade. <laughs> These folks would do it. They, 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 can, they, can, they can invent ways to make stuff wrong. It is almost as if you could not make them help themselves do right because it seems like they are determined to do wrong. I don't know what makes them this way, but there are people, it seems, that, can, that have a genius for being hateful. I'm not calling any particular names, but you have your favorite candidate. I mean, you, you, you know of people who you don't have to help be hateful. And that's the word in verse four. Look at the proud, their spirit is not right in them. You came. You can't make them do right by reading the Bible. You can't make them do right by telling them the golden rule. You can't make them do right by saying, listen, if you do right, we'll do it. They just cannot. Th 
And then that last line, but the righteous live by their what? Now, notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say the righteous live by their finances. It did not say the righteous live by their finances, did it? It said, that suggests that you may be righteous and broke. Hello? And the unrighteous may be unrighteous and rolling roll, roll around in money. You may be righteous and you may be righteously unemployed while the unrighteous person is getting the job. You may be righteous and worrying about whether or not you're going to have enough to pay the bills where the unrighteous person has got money on top of money. The righteous don't live by their finances. Not only that, the righteous not only don't live by their by the facts. Now, that doesn't mean that the righteous are fools. But you understand that facts don't necessarily make for truth. Hmm. What do you mean, preacher? The facts may be against you, but the facts may have been manufactured by the frauds. By, you understand, if you have the power to lie about what the facts are, you have the power to manufacture facts that are not true. You heard of weapons of mass destruction? Still looking for them, right? In Iran. They, they, they went to the world and said, these are the facts. And people went to Iraq and died, and the team came back scarred for life because of facts that were manufactured. Hello? The righteous don't live by their finances. The righteous don't live by the facts. The righteous live by their faith. Now, that doesn't mean that faith is non-fact. Faith is Transfect. Now you say, what is transfect? Remember, I'm a preacher of the gospel. I have a license in law and ministry in two ways to use words. Faith is transfect. Faith transcends facts. What do you mean, preacher? For if the earthly tabernacle of this house is destroyed, we have a house not made with hands. You haven't seen that house, have you? Huh? But we believe in that. That's trans fact. You remember that word from 2 Corinthians 4th chapter? The things we see are temporary, but the things that are not seen are eternal trans fact now abide if faith hope and charity love faith is what you believe in hope is what you're seeing and hoping to get but neither faith nor hope are fact if you if it's faith it's not fact you don't have to have faith if you got the facts so the faith is not the facts, and you don't have to have hope if you got the facts. You don't have to hope for a pony for Christmas if you got the pony. <laughs> faith and hope are trans fact. The righteous live by their faith. And the painful realities of living with hurt, when you're living with hurt, is that you have to be able to dig deep in your faith ground. Where it is dry on top of the ground, you got to have a faith ground somewhere. Where faith is being watered. Where your roots of your soul dig deep and find that faith. Mm. The righteous live by faith. And so the prophet says, I'm going to stand in my watch post with my roots digging deep, waiting for the Lord. And we hear that word in the Lord and my light and my salvation, wait on the Lord and be of good courage. 
wait on the Lord and be of good courage. They that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up. Not, 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 not those that give up on the Lord, but they that wait on the Lord, they shall mount up. In other words, they'll sprout some wings. Waiting and running and not get weary. Waiting and walking and not fainting. Waiting as the situation doesn't change. Waiting because the unchanging situation cannot outweigh the God who is bigger than the changes we need. And so we wait. Not as idle people, but we wait as hopeful people. Working with God while we wait. There is a lesson about an old monk who, it is said, had taken up a residence on the side of a mountain. And a young novice had come to see him and says, Monk, a number of people have wanted to come to this mountain and commune with God, but after a year or two, they leave. You've been here all these years. Why? He said, let me tell you a story. He said, a story about a dog who saw a rabbit. And the dog began to chase the rabbit. A white rabbit. And the dog never did catch the white rabbit, but he kept running for the white rabbit. And as the dog chased the white rabbit, other dogs began barking and enjoying the chase. And eventually those dogs stopped chasing. But this one never did stop. Do you know why it didn't stop? The other dogs were chasing the barking dog. This dog was chasing the rabbit. Ah, oh, brothers and sisters, make sure that we in our faith are chasing the God we have seen and known and not the God whose other folks are making noise about. You understand? You see what? The other dogs were chasing the barking. And after they got tired of following the barking dog, they stopped. But the dog who had seen the rabbit kept running. Have you seen God? Have you seen God working in your life? Has God made a way out of no way when other folks said there wasn't going to be a way made? Has God opened doors that you didn't know what existed and other folks said it couldn't be opened? Has God answered prayer you didn't have sense enough to pray and answered prayers after you got tired of praying? Ah, then you know you have seen. Run on, run on, run on, amen.